Hej och välkomna till Main Hall och ett pass som Roger Andersson på vår IT kommer att hålla kring integrationsregister och hur man får ordning på sina integrationer. Ja. Då lämnar jag varm hand över till dig. Tack. Uh, I was asked to uh, listen in English. Are there any English speaking here? Otherwise, we'll do it in Swedish. Yeah, you want it in English? Okay, then. I think it is. <laughs> it's very hard to see people up here uh, in the limelight. Okay, um, so a little bit of my background. Um, I've been a solution software architect for a number of years, uh, worked in telecom at Ericsson, I've been at uh, Volvo Cars, uh, mainly within Java and Oracle for the past four years. Uh, I've been at Volvo, uh, the Volvo Group. Um, I have actually three roles, three hats. Um, I'm the chief architect of our delivery center, integration delivery center. Uh, I'm also part of uh, ADT, which is our department for methods and tooling around integration. Uh, and my third role is um, as a member of uh, Volvo Group Integration Office, which is part of our CIO function, um, how we govern integrations. Um, the content, uh, I will describe a little bit about Volvo Group to give you an understanding of uh, what environment we are working in. Um, then a little bit about the integration of Volvo, uh, how, how we organize our different, uh, uh, the different functions, uh, how we govern integrations and how we develop and uh, approve integrations. Then coming into the actual topic, uh, the integration registry, or how we keep track of integrations. Uh, first, the scoping. How do we think about uh, when we are going to develop this first version? Um, then what solution do we, did we decide to build? Uh, and then going into the tool, giving an example of how we document uh, one integration. And some concluding words. Uh, our experience, what did we learn? Uh, was it the correct choice? Uh, etc. So just uh, for you that are confused between Volvo and Volvo, uh, I'm rep representing the Volvo Group, and that's the truck part. Uh, so uh, in '99 we sold off uh, Volvo cars to Ford at that point in time. Uh, but it's not only Volvo trucks. Uh, we have excavators. Uh, we own both Renault trucks and Mack trucks. Uh, UD trucks in Japan, we have joint ventures, etc. So it's quite a big company. Uh, and of course, with all those acquisitions, uh, our system landscape is quite diverse. Uh, these are the brands that we have uh, in the Volvo group. So as you can see, it's not only Volvo, uh, it's a number of those. And of course, we have Volvo Penta as well. I forgot to mention that. Uh, we're around 120,000 persons worldwide, uh, production in 20 countries, uh, we have a net sales of around 300 billion Swedish crowns, and the IT spend is roughly 2% of that. Uh, so it's uh, quite a lot uh, spent in IT, and of course integration comes into many of those parts. So the situation we are in is that, yes, we have done a lot of acquisitions and we have old system from Mac trucks in the US, UD truck in Japan, Renault truck in France, uh, we have joint ventures, and of course uh, those systems are both uh, in-house systems built in the 80s, uh, it's board systems, it's new cut systems, um, so, so it's a huge mi mix. Uh, of what we need to integrate. And of course we have the new trends like mobile that needs to come into this picture as well, uh, which is quite tricky, uh, as you most probably know, to, to get into this integration landscape in a good way. Uh, handling security and uh, guaranteed delivery and things like that. And in a big company like this, uh, it's many integrations, extremely many integrations. Uh, and we, we don't really know how many we have uh, uh, because we have done integrations for so many years. Uh, of course, if you go out to each application or not, they have control, but from an overview level, 
we don't we cannot say uh, exactly how many we have. Uh, so that's of course one of the purposes of this too, to at least in, in one area to have uh, control over our integrations and how we build them. Going into how it looks like uh, at Volvo, uh, and the focus point here is the integration delivery center because that is what we built the integration registry for, so that's why IDC is in the middle. Uh, around IDC we have uh, one supporting function, that's the ADT, as I mentioned before, that is responsible for providing the tooling, the methods, guidelines around how we develop integrations at Volvo. And we have the infrastructure and operations that takes care of having our key managers, brokers, uh, things like that up and running, and of course doing the deployment uh, in test QA production of all the different things that we develop uh, at IC. Then we have our customers, uh, typically IT projects, uh, that puts a request to IC. Uh, and that could range from a, a one simple integration to the really huge IT programs where they request 150 integrations uh, over a number of years. I forgot that I have this in my hand. Uh, all of this is all about IT. Uh, but then we have a governance function as well, uh, both in each company, uh, which you see here, the track division and business areas, as we call them. Uh, and we have the Volvo Group Integration Office, uh, which is on the Volvo Group level. And in these different integration offices, uh, that's where we actually decide if, the, if this is the correct integration to build or not. So we, we have an approval on first, uh, from a business point of view, is this the correct information uh, to do? Are we taking the information from the correct source? Uh, how does it affect our business processes? And then there is the next decision, uh, are we doing it in the correct way, uh, are we using the correct technologies for this integration. So that's not up to uh, Volvo IT uh, as the delivery unit within, the IT delivery unit within uh, Volvo Group to do that. Uh, there is a separate governance function. A little bit about numbers. Uh, in IDC uh, there were roughly 110 persons. Uh, 60 developers, 40 architects, something like that. Uh, 30 persons uh, in INO, infrastructure and operations, around 10 uh, in AT. Um, and then in the governance, but those are not full time, all of those, but involved in taking decisions around integrations, we have around 80 persons in the different companies uh, and around 10 uh, on the global group level. So there are quite many people involved uh, in the integration area. Uh, but this is, yeah, we can take this one as well. And we get around 1,000 requests per year into IEC of different, from different projects. And as I said, those can range from 1 to 100 integrations. Uh, and we have around 500 integration requests, as we call them, requests for approval of integrations up to our integration offices. Um, Unfortunately, this is not all. Uh, I'm not covering uh, B2B at all in this picture, uh, the EDI uh, part of it. Um, there's also a lot of integration that's actually handled by the applications themselves. As um, um, IDC only needs to be involved if there is a the broker involved, uh, and also if the application doesn't have the competence themselves. Some more numbers, some more sizes to give you an understanding of the environment we're working in. Uh, around 2,800 applications uh, that we integrate. Uh, now I'm talking about the Volvo Group in total. Uh, VCOM is our old uh, message oriented middleware that uh, was uh, built by Volvo uh, back in the 70s or 80s, I don't really know. Uh, and that's still, the major, majority of our integration is still uh, done in that way. Um, we have around 180,000 of those queues and around 53,000 MQ queues, which we're gradually moving over to. 
if we look at what IDC is responsible for, uh, we, we need to keep track of 540 of those applications. That's what we are integrating. Uh, we have around a bit, little bit more than 2,000 2, integrations that we either maintain uh, or are under construction. And as I said, 110 persons. So, uh, of course, we need some kind of tool to keep tr track of all of this, uh, because it's a lot. So, when we started uh, to discuss about the registry, uh, service registry, we looked into different requirements. Uh, and examples from the business is uh, to be able to track information flows, to be able to do impact analysis. If I remove this master data application, what will happen? Uh, service governance. Uh, if I develop those services within this uh, domain, uh, how do I do the life cycle management? Things like that. From IT, uh, yeah, then of course it's more IT related. It's configuration management. How do I keep track of versions? How do I know what infrastructure is involved? Uh, how do I do maintenance and support when there's an error? How do I actually get to the correct documentation for that integration? So, yeah, a lot of requirements when you actually start to discuss this. But we had a very early constraint, and that is, this is not going to be this huge big bang, this huge project. It needs to be lean and very limited so that we succeed. So we took a, a very conscious decision of having a very limited scope uh, in order to not solve everything in the world. We put IDC in focus. Uh, that was the first decision, that this should support IDC operation. So not solving everything in the group. We should structure the documentation so you know exactly where to find the documentation for each integration. It should be service oriented. Uh, even if we had, we have still, uh, and we in the history we have made a lot of those point-to-point -point integrations. But still, we decided no, we want to look at them in a service oriented way, so that we can potentially reuse them and also get that mindset uh, into the people working with integrations. Ownership is very important at Volvo. Um, yeah, in many organizations, at least what I've heard, I've not worked with them, uh, you have central ownership of the integration platform and the artifacts in there. Uh, at Volvo it's different. The, the central organization is actually not owning anything. It's owned by the respective application. And then IDC is maintaining that on behalf of the application. So the application is always responsible both for the core application and all the infrastructure that is needed to actually produce or consume a service. So that part is also extremely important for us. We want to be able to trace the approvals. So when we have an integration uh, running in production, we want to be able to get back to the document uh, and uh, the approval from the integration office, who actually took this decision. Uh, and also the other way around. What about this decision we t took uh, two years ago? What, what did happen? How much of that actually ended up in production? And logging uh, and, and connections to our uh, configuration management database for infrastructure. Um, and we decided quite early on that uh, we're going to use SharePoint uh, and not buy a big two. So when we did this scoping and only looking at IC, uh, we started to look into, okay, what is the problem with the IC? And how did it look like? I think this was two, three years ago. Um, as we had consolidated IC from a number of smaller uh, integration delivery centers or, uh, or uh, integration competence centers, we were using CVS, Subversion, clear case, and um, it was not only one CVS, it was 10 CVS uh, with different structures. It was uh, uh, one clear case, that, that one was actually quite good structuring, uh, and the number of subversions. 
so that was, of course, one goal to get all of that uh, into one tool with the same structure. Uh, we were using SharePoint uh, for all our documents, uh, like landscapes, uh, implementation specifications, and there were also different folder structures for different integrations. There, there were a top layer that was common, but below that everything looked, looked different. And it was, there were no version control, no tagging of those documents. Uh, a lot of the landscapes were also point to point. Uh, and of course, if you don't reuse integrations, that, that's quite okay, because you get overview directly. But when you start to do more service-oriented integrations, uh, and you maybe have 15 consumers from a, a master data service, that is not a good thing uh, to have 15 landscapes with a lot of uh, duplicated information. And there was also unclear ownership of the infrastructure. Uh, as I said before, ownership is very important for us. And when you just have a transformation in a point-to-point -point integration, uh, and there is no, it's not visible who is actually owning it. Then it's also very hard to, for IC to, to say yes or no to the one that is actually requesting a change because we don't know exactly who is actually authorized to, to make that change. So as I said, uh, the first, or one of the first things we did uh, was decide upon a service-oriented model uh, for documenting things. And this is very close to baseline, uh, and it's also influenced by baseline because that is what we have worked with in some areas uh, with the Volvo group before. Um, so we have a service. Um, a service, there's all, always an application that is providing that service. And a service can have one or two messages. Typically one, but in a request reply scenario, there is two. And the reason for uh, actually having the message in the model as well is that in some areas we're using canonical message formats. And we would like to track in what integration or in what services is actually this canonical message used in. On the other side, on the consuming side, uh, we, we have the application as a consumer and we have a contract from the consuming application to the service. This is uh, today more of uh, just a relation. It doesn't uh, carry that much information. Here, of course, we could have SLAs and things like that, but we have not come that far. And on top of that, we need to document uh, yeah, landscapes, we need to have the source code if we're using the broker, uh, and we name that implementation. So for the consumer side, there's one implementation, and for the providing side, there's one implementation. Also in line with, our own, with how we look at ownership. It's very important for us to keep those separate. Another thing that was uh, very early on decided was that we, we need to create very strict boundaries. We have a number of things already in place in this area. Uh, and we don't want to store duplicate information if not necessary. And we don't want to go into a different areas that is actually not our responsibility. Uh, so yellow pages, that is what we call our application catalog or application registry on the Volvo Group. Of course, we don't want to master that. We want to get, take the definition of an application from that registry. Uh, MISP is, is our tool for keeping track of all our queues, uh, bar files, uh, all the infrastructure that we have uh, in all our environments, test, queue, and production. And also there, we don't want to duplicate that information into the registry. So there is no infrastructure documentation, uh, infrastructure uh, in the registry, more than, of course, the landscapes, but we don't keep uh, information of error queues uh, and things like that. We have a tool for logging, uh, and also here, uh, as you also saw in one presentation from baseline, 
if you attend that one, we want to create a link here. If we get an error in the logging or also positive logging, we want to be able to easily get that tag uh, and get into the registry to find the documentation and find who is actually affected uh, by this message going into error. Because typically, at least in our case, the logging is extremely technical. Normally what you see there is queue names um, and some stack trace from Java. It doesn't give you any business meaning. But when you connect it to the registry, at least you, you get the applications that are involved. You, you get the name of the message. And then you can start the discussion with the different maintenance organizations around this application and try to understand what has actually gone wrong. Uh, we also have a repository for source code documentation, uh, so we need a connection to that as well. We didn't want to store that in SharePoint. Uh, we would like to have a real uh, version control system and we have chosen Subversion as the only one to use. So we have full tagging possibilities and branching, uh, things like that, also for the documentation. And as I mentioned before, we want to be able to track our approvals. So you want to have a relation to the approvals uh, in the integration request, so that we can track the governance decision uh, into what's actually being implemented. So the reason for choosing SharePoint uh, is already widely used at Volvo, uh, which was a very good thing, of course. People are used to working with it. We didn't need to do that much education. People were used to work with SharePoint lists uh, and things like that. Uh, it's already well integrated in the IT environment. Uh, there is connection to AD. Uh, you can set up authority in a quite uh, easy way. So we didn't need to solve that thing. It was a short startup time. It was already in Volvo. We didn't need any new approvals. Uh, for taking in a new technology. And we also, of course, needed a tool that could handle quite many users. Uh, today, there are around 100, a bit more, that is actively using it also for writing. Uh, and I estimated around 300 that is only using it for reading. So it should be able to handle that load. It's not extreme, uh, but still, it's a lot of users to keep track of. But then, of course, having a standard tool gives you limitations. Uh, and one is that it can only handle simple validation rules. It's very hard to implement rules. If you don't, we decided early on that we didn't want to customize a lot. We were going to use standard plugins instead. So it's very hard to do things like if this field is filled with this value, then disable this field. Uh, if this field is filled in, this is mandatory. Uh, and that is, of course, not a good thing. Uh, but that is something that we have to live with uh, when we chose this tool. You can have relations between entities, uh, service to application, uh, contract to service, but there are limitations. Uh, and it's not supported out of the box in a good way. So here we need to buy some plugins to solve that. The search possibilities uh, is not very good. Uh, of course, you can do free text search in, in SharePoint, uh, but you will not get directly into our views where, you will, where it will be presented in a good way. Instead, you will get the individual list items, and you need to know how to take those identifiers to get into the correct place in the user interface. So the usability, uh, yeah, there's a lack of usability in that area. Initial load uh, is also a problem. Uh, it's not easy to, to do. Um, I mean, if you have a normal relation database, SQL Server or Oracle, it's very easy to do those mass updates or in, 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 do the initial loads. Here, it's hidden. The database, is hid even if it's SQL Server, it's hidden below SharePoint. And you, you cannot do operations directly to the database. Uh, you can probably, but uh, it's a proprietary structure, so you don't want to do that. Yeah, the migration of data I mentioned. Mm -hmm. 
So now let's go into an example of uh, how we actually document wine integration. I will take a quite simple example. Uh, so it's but one application called RM, uh, sending customer orders to a system called uh, VITBS. Um, and the VITBS is actually handling billing uh, of this customer order. So first of all, of course, we need to identify the applications in yellow pages. Um, so that's our source of applications. So we find those. Uh, with the IDs, and those are the ones that we actually going to use uh, in our registry. And this is how it looks like. Uh, we have a short name, uh, a Volvo unique ID to uniquely identify this if it's renamed, and some organizational stuff. And then also, it, did we find it in yellow pages or not? We also have uh, responsibility for setting up external integrations to external systems, and of course, then we don't find it in your pages. Then we need to ask, how do you name the application? So that's very simple. Uh, then we need to identify the service, um, and sometimes this is simple. Sometimes it's more thought of point-to-point -point integration, and of course, it's harder. Uh, in this case, it's actually VITBS providing a service of being able to bill this customer uh, order. So it's a, a pretty simple thing. Uh, what we have to do here as well is to decide upon a naming convention of our services to, to get everything consistent. Uh, and we looked at wages and how they name things and decided, okay, that's a quite big uh, industry standard, so let's go for that. So we're using the verbs uh, and their meaning from the wages, the get, show, process, uh, but then we're using our own nouns uh, that is taken from the business, our business terms. So when, when we see a service called get customer, we know that it is a request to apply, we know that it's, it's not affecting the data in the other system. If it's a process, we know that we're actually handing over uh, the responsibility of this object from one system to another. So going back to the wages definitions. And that has proven to be quite good. Instead of each uh, integration architect having to come up with their own verb uh, and maybe ending up with 50 uh, different ones that you don't really know what they mean. So, um, this is how it then will be set up. Uh, going back to our concept model, you recognize this. We have the application, we have a service, and we have a message. So we have the VITB VS application as a service provider. We have a service in this uh, example called process customer order, because we're actually handing over the responsibility uh, of this customer order to the VITBS for them to actually process it and bill it uh, to the customer. And we need to have a message uh, that is called customer order in this case. <coughs> and more or less looks the same, again. Uh, it's based on the SharePoint lists. So everything looks more or less like this. We create the message. Uh, in this case, the message domain is application. Uh, this is not the canonical message format that is owned by a central organization. This message format is owned by the application. So that, that's why it says message domain application here. We have a message name, a version, and that's its XML. Uh, and as it is a message domain application, there is also an owner of this message, and it's VITBS in this case. <coughs> And there is also the possibility to have a URL and to link to the schema uh, if needed, so that you know where to find it. The service, uh, process customer order, we have a version there as well, uh, in this case 1.0. We have the ownership, the provider of that server, uh, service, VITBS. We link in the message, that this message is used in this service. Uh, and we also uh, enter some of those high-level attributes, like uh, the endpoint is a queue, so that is how 
you actually access the service, you put your customer order on an MQ queue to invoke it. Uh, it is a fire and forget. Uh, and it's initiated by the consumer. The consuming side, there we need to set up the application as well, of course, if it's not already in the registry, and the contract. Uh, I will not show the application as I've already shown that. But the contract looks like this, uh, not having that much information, as I said, more the relation. So it's linking the, the contract to the service uh, and saying that the consumer in this case is RM, and RM is owning this contract. Um, I've done a bit of obfuscating as uh, those presentations are going to be public, that's why you see a little bit of uh, erased <laughs> uh, characters. Uh, this is the view we get uh, when we have entered uh, it in the registry. Uh, I will um, magnify it a bit. So on the top we can see one application, the uh, VATBS. Uh, below that we are able to see all the services that VITB is providing to the left. And if we click on one of those services, we can see all the consumers of that service. So in this case, I've selected the process customer order. Uh, and as, as you can see, there's only one consumer of that service. And to the right, we can see all the services that VITB is, is consuming. Uh, I think it's four of them in this case, from different applications within Volvo. And we also get it graphically, at least the overview of being able to see that uh, the ITBS is providing free services to the left. Um, we can also, how can I use the pointer? There. We can see with a straight line directly that this is in production. Uh, when it's dashed, uh, it's either in test or QA, it's at least not in production. So we get the big uh, the overview. And this works pretty OK up to maybe 20, 30 integrations. Uh, on top of that, uh, it's, it gets too big. But at least the ma majority of our applications, this works pretty well to get the overview uh, dynamically drawn uh, in the two. Uh, the next step was the, to track this to the approval. Uh, and then we have introduced uh, um, the integration um, yeah, entity uh, tying together uh, this, uh, this integration from RM to VITBS. So here we are back to seeing this as one integration because that's the way we actually approve things at Volvo. So we don't approve the service and the contract separately. So there is the integration that is then tying together this integration, and we have the approval. Uh, I will not go into much detail here, but this is the way we, we can see it in the tool, that when we look at this integration which, which, between VATB and ORAM, uh, we can directly see that it is approved. Uh, we can see here, uh, I think it's too small for you, the ID, where it's the integration request ID and the link to the contract uh, that is the more IT related thing. And of course we can turn that the other way around uh, to see from one contract uh, in what integration request was that actually approved. Um, storing, yeah, as I said, the, the implementation uh, and the documents of that needs to go into subversion because we want to have that version controlled. So the implementation entity is actually uh, split in two. The attributes of an implementation uh, is stored in the tool, in the registry, in SharePoint, but all the documentation, source code, uh, messages, uh, things like that that you, that you need to have uh, in the implementation is stored and version control is subversion. And that is what IDC integration repository. Um, yeah, and there is an example of that, uh, also of our ownership. Uh, that the green box here that indicates that 
RM is owning the contract and the implementation for that contract. And the blue box, that's the provider, that's the VNGBS uh, owning the service, taking full responsibility for that, and the implementation of that. Even if IDC is building part of it, they still have um, the ownership. Um, some example of uh, attributes, so it's not that many uh, in uh, the registry for an implementation. We, we have a name, uh, we have the owner, VATBS, right, actually there. Uh, and we have a calculated documentation link to Subversion. So we have structured Subversion in a way that we actually can have dynamic links that are calculated instead of having them uh, manually in the tool entered every, every time. And that helps a lot when we are moving things around in Subversion, uh, not having to manually update all of those links. Because uh, today I think that, that there is maybe 1,500 links or something like that, uh, and that, that it helps a lot having them uh, dynamic. Uh, yeah, just an information of how it looks like in Subversion. I will not go into the details. Uh, but also here, it's very clear who's owning it. We have the implementation name and a standard structure uh, for each implementation with documentation, uh, source code if needed, uh, configuration. And an example uh, is, for instance, a landscape, uh, which we draw like this. So we're not uh, drawing the end-to-end -end landscapes any longer. They are also drawn in a service-oriented way. So here is the service from VITBS, uh, an adapter, we're using SAP PI for this one. There is an in queue, that is the uh, endpoint for this, and the service. Uh, and this ID is of course the same as we find in the registry. And to be able to find out how the end-to-end -end integration looks like, you also need to look into the implementation of the contract side, where you will find the rest of how actually it's sent from RM. Uh, this is how our logging tool works. Uh, so when we have logged an event uh, from the broker or from MQ, we will get the service ID and the implementation ID in here. Uh, we have not gone that far yet, uh, as they have done in baseline, we actually can click it. Uh, you have to manually take this uh, ID into the registry to find uh, find the documentation and find how, who is using this service, who could be affected uh, by uh, a message on an error queue. Uh, but that is something that uh, is much wanted and probably will be the next step of having that more automated. Okay, some conclusions. Going back to the original problem definition, did we solve it? Um, yes. Uh, we are almost there uh, of having everything in one subversion, in one structure. Um, we have some small repositories still that we need to migrate, but almost. Uh, we have <coughs> removed, or we're not using the old SharePoint structures any longer. Everything goes in to the registry and that uh, having everything in the same way. And we have also removed the point-to-point -point documentation. We have split uh, most landscapes into the, uh, the consuming part and uh, the providing part, so that we can keep the, the clear ownership. So was it the correct decision? Um, first, was it correct to actually document this service-oriented instead of actually documented integration by integration? Uh, and I strongly believe that, yes, definitely. Uh, it is, of course, hard to take an old integration where they've only thought about point to point and try to squeeze that into a service-oriented mindset. But I, I still think it's worth it because you get the mindset of ser service orientation into every new integration that you build. And you're forced to think about reusability if it's possible in this area because you need to define a service in the tool. 
SharePoint, uh, I, think, I still think it was the correct decision at that point in time. Otherwise, we would probably not have achieved. But we are on the limits. Uh, there are definitely usability problems uh, and things that we would like to do. So it might not be the correct tool in the future. But we still we have a concept model. Everything is modeled according to that. Uh, so it's quite easy uh, to take the data into another tool if it can support that quite simple concept model. Uh, oops. Buy uh, versus build. Uh, I mean, we, we built it on top of SharePoint. We could have bought a standard solution like Central Site or uh, IBM's, whatever it's called now. Uh, but we, we still think we have learned a lot uh, building it. We would probably not have been very good uh, at putting requirements on a cost product uh, two years ago. Now we would be a much better buyer uh, if we were going to get out there and look for tools. Uh, return on investment. Of course, I don't have any figures. It's very hard uh, to say if we get the money back. But in IDC, it, we need something at least to keep track of it. it. It could be Excel, it could be whatever, but some kind of tool to keep track of all the integrations. Uh, and this was pretty cheap. Uh, and we, we see that it's giving higher quality in our deliveries. Uh, it also has enabled us uh, to go from 20 persons to 110 persons uh, in a better way. That's my firm belief. Uh, that having a structured way of thinking, of documenting, uh, it's much easier to extend uh, and, and take on uh, personnel. And also in different sites. Key success factors. Uh, the limited scope. Uh, to actually limit it, to get the solution out there that is actually used, I think is one of the key things that uh, was really, really good that we decided early on. Not to take this huge uh, thing where, where, with a lot of uh, nice to haves. Uh, because, of course, there is a lot of things you, you would like to have. You, you, of course, we would like to see all of all the group's integrations in, in a good way. And what happens if that queue manager goes down? What, that, what the integrations are affected? Uh, but I, I don't think that we ever would have gotten all the data in there to do that uh, for many, many, many years. And another thing, uh, when we started this, uh, we put the tool out there, we educated people. But when people get under stress, uh, a lot of pressure from the IT projects, it's very easy to, if the thing is working in production, to forget about the registry. So for us, having so many people in IEC in, in different locations, uh, putting in place a review process where it's actually mandatory to have things in the registry, even before you go into design, and then check before you go to deployment, that is, has been absolutely necessary for us to get all integrations in there. Otherwise, the architect is going on to the next assignment uh, before, uh, if there is a lot of, under, under a lot of stress and it's forgotten, uh, and we, don't, we cannot trust the data. Okay, that was all I had. Any questions? Yes? Yeah. Regarding SharePoint, choice of SharePoint, was it... Uh, were you using the database inside the SharePoint or for structuring? Yeah, we're using the standard SharePoint lists. Uh, and the list you can define uh, the different attributes that you want, and you can also relate lists to each other. So it is sort of a relational database, uh, at least the same, same mindset. But there are restrictions and limitations on what you can do. And under, under the hoods, yes, there, there is a Microsoft database, dependent on what version of SharePoint you're using. Uh, they're using SQL Server, or I don't know, they, yeah, they have a light version as well uh, of SQL Server. But that structure, that database structure, um, that is nothing that you want to go into. Uh, because, of course, it can change when they change version, and it's not really things that you see. Okay. But is it a clear roadmap for SharePoint 
database? Yes, I mean, we're using standard SharePoint lists. So I cannot see that they will remove it. Of course, if they choose to remove SharePoint lists, uh, then we have a problem. Uh, but if they maintain that concept, uh, I think we will have quite easy to migrate to new versions. Uh, we could get problems with the plugins that we're using uh, if they are not maintained and updated to the later versions. Uh, the good things that I mentioned about SharePoint uh, was that all at Volvo are used to using it. Uh, and but you didn't, didn't find any technical advantages? Not really. Uh, I mean, it's very easy to set up those lists, but uh, when you're trying to do more advanced things with it, uh, you, you get into the limitations very, very quickly. Hmm? I'm curious about uh, the, the reasons behind your choice of sub version versus the other. Um, <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, what was the reason for choosing subversion over CVS uh, and ClearCase? Uh, and the reason is, is that in, as we're using Java, we we're not using eSQL. Uh, e uh, we're using Java only for doing broker development. And in our Java development track uh, at Volvo, we're using Subversion, so we're sharing tools. Uh, so it was a natural decision uh, to use Subversion here as well. And we were also using other tools like Maven, uh, JUnit uh, from, from the Java. Uh, so that's uh, where we uh, continue to use that. Yes? Uh, your, your review process made sure that the, the, the integrations were documented, but uh, when there's an update, uh, how does that review process catch uh, changes, for instance, the addition of a new contract? So the question was, uh, we have a review process for new integrations, what happens in maintenance or support cases? Uh, we have a light review process for that. So in, in the, when there's new development, uh, we have four roles uh, looking into it. We have the configuration management role, we have an architect, we have uh, infrastructure operation, and we have te uh, maintenance. Uh, but in a light review, it's only looked uh, at from CM, uh, configuration management, and maintenance, to see that everything is uh, updated. So there is a light review also uh, securing that it's updated. Is it some kind of uh, human workflow involved in this process that you implemented with the SharePoint? Uh, I, I, I actually didn't include that in the presentation of how we actually do that uh, review, but we have built an extension uh, to the registry where we keep track of all the reviews. So when an architect thinks that now I'm ready for doing a design review, uh, he puts up the implementation services and contract that he wants to review, book a time slot uh, in a calendar, uh, and then there are we have um, two hours meet, two hour meetings, uh, Tuesday and Thursday. Uh, 15 minutes each for a time slot, where all those functions go in uh, and look at it and put an approval or not from a technical perspective uh, on the integrations. Yes? Um, in, in the information model uh, for the registry, you have the messages directly coupled to the uh, services. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we have three patterns. Uh, it's fire and forget, publish, subscribe, uh, and request supply. Yeah. And, and did you consider to, to um, uh, let the service be a container for a number of such uh, interactions? Like uh, in, in SOAP, you, you, uh, you define a service as uh, a container for multiple operations. Okay, no, I understand. So, 
Um, yeah, but if you compare to SERP, then, then you have uh, the WISDA that can contain many operations. And of course, for each operation, you can have different messages. Uh, now we decided early on to have it quite simple, that uh, one service is one message. Yes? Uh, how much does uh, the, this ICC uh, influence uh, canonical uh, uh, formats and uh, informati information management and so on? How, uh, is, it, is it just transport information or is it to look into it and try to make corporate uh, structures and so on? No, I, it's not ICC responsibility to look into that, but of, of course the, the integration architect is working in that area. Uh, they have close corporations with the persons that are responsible for it. And we have, I mean, we are not using canonical message format all over the world group, but we have different domains uh, where it's handled. Uh, and they, were, they are typically owned by the governance uh, function, the CAO staff functions, uh, those are canonical message formats. And the integration architect will put a request uh, for a new message format. Uh, and then there will, of course, be a discussion of uh, re uh, requirements and things like that. But the ICC is not responsible for maintaining or developing those. Only to, we actually store them also in subversion, but that's only the technical part, helping the business to do the version handling uh, and publishing them to different applications. But are you cooperating then with this governance office that you see that now there's an integration again, which is very, very similar, transporting similar data, maybe this could be because maybe the, for the particular project, they don't have any idea that somebody else is having the same. Mm. Uh, so how do we identify reuse of a message or a service? Uh, and uh, the responsibility actually lies within the integration office to the left there. Uh, in that integration office, there, there is enterprise architects, integration architects, there is business persons. Uh, they often involve system owners to, that is responsible for having this holistic view and being able to identify that. If we look in the real world, yeah, it, it could often be that the integration architect from IDC actually know that because he has worked in that area before. But the responsibility uh, lies within the integration office. No more questions? Okay, thanks. Thank you, Roger, for this great presentation, letting us